This what one. Is, what are you recording? I'm not recording anything. Hello, everyone. We'll get started here in a minute. Expect a few more trickling in. Scott, let's give it another minute and then we'll kick okay. it off. All right. All right. I think we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Oline. I am the Government Affairs Chairman for 2023, and I want to welcome you all to this Government Affairs Committee update. And I do appreciate all of you taking the time this afternoon to participate in this update. I think this is one of the strengths of this, of the NRMCA is the fact that an engaged membership is an effective membership especially when it comes to advocacy. So thank you all for participating today. I'm pretty sure we're not gonna get a classified briefing on the unidentified objects that were shot down recently, but Andrew and Danny will talk about and discuss the 118th Congress, some of the proposed legislation and some of the proposed regulatory changes that can and will impact our industry. Uh, before I do turn it over to Andrew, though, I need to remind everyone that this meeting will be conducted in strict compliance with the antitrust policy statement that you see on your screen. If anyone has any concerns during the course of this meeting, please make them known. The meeting will be stopped and the concerns addressed. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Scott. Mr. Chairman, I certainly appreciate uh, you opening us up here. Um, Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time uh, this Wednesday afternoon to um, engage with the NRMCA Government Affairs Committee. Uh, as Scott said, here's our agenda. We're going to take a look at the formation of the 118th Congress, um, take a look at the legislative outlook for this year, uh, some issues that pertain particularly to the ready mix industry, um, some of our engagement and coalition partnerships some of our upcoming calls and events, and then open it for questions and discussion. If at any one time anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and we can uh, answer them. Uh, this is a small enough group as well. Um, please feel free to you know, either raise a hand or speak up and we can uh, have a discussion about anything um, as we go along. So uh, I'd note too that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so uh, if you would just minimize background noise and keep yourself on mute if you're able to um, until you're uh, or unless you're speaking. So thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we'll just kick it off really quick uh, overview of you know, what happened last November. Um, obviously, the uh, the House uh, was taken back by the Republicans uh, with a very slim majority uh, and the Senate uh, Democrats expanded their majority um, by one with a pickup in Pennsylvania. So um, Republicans picked up a total of nine in the House um, and then one in the Senate. And this is what the uh, balance of power in the in the two chambers looks like right now. Um, with that very slim majority, the Republicans went into the beginning of the Congress um, with some uncertainty. Uh, that's clearly reflected in the speaker elections that um, were scheduled to take place on January 3rd. 
ended up taking place on January 3rd, January 4th, January 5th, January 6th, and then finally concluded on January 7th. Over 15 rounds of voting in a historic election. I um, would say this uh, remind, brought back some interesting memories for me of the last time there was a contested speakers race back in 2015. And uh, I was a fresh faced staffer with a front row seat to some interesting machinations. Along with the um, election of the speaker, we also had an adoption of the rules. Uh, some of the notable uh, aspects of the rules of the House for the 118th Congress um, are that the um, spending limits of the of the U.S. Congress, or at least as pertains to um, spending bills generated in the House, um, are frozen essentially at 2022 levels, and any uh, debt limit increases have to be paired with spending cuts, something that's surely going to put the uh, particular uh, factions on a collision course. You saw some of that uh, taking place even today as Senate Republicans told um, Senate or uh, House Republicans that they would not go along with any spending cuts related to defense. So a number of um, uh, dynamics that are going to going to play out throughout the year as we uh, watch Congress grapple with not just spending, but also debt limit. Um, the lateness of the finalization of the speaker uh, also impacted the organization of committees and sort of got the 118th Congress off to a somewhat slow start. Um, so the steering committee is made up of um, uh, a, a number of members and um, Five of those are selected by the Speaker of the House. And so without a speaker, you don't have a steering committee. Without a steering committee, uh, you don't have um, finalized rosters for committees um, uh, or chairman or subcommittee chairman. Uh, and so the finalization and organization of committees uh, did not fully um, take place until uh, even uh, uh, as late as last week, we had a few more members named to various committees. Um, it also impacted the negotiation of ratios between the minority and, and majority. Um, but uh, that is, that's all worked out now. And so we do have an idea of what the um, 118th Congress looks like. No surprise to anyone on uh, House leadership side. Uh, I think uh, Kevin McCarthy was a, a um, you know, sort of a foregone core inclusion, even if it was a, a, a little bit of a slog getting there. Um, on the Democratic side, you did have a, a really um, a sea change. You had a, a shift in power, turning over of, of, uh, of or turning of the, of the page, a new chapter um, with Hakeem Jeffries um, becoming the leader of the uh, Democratic Party. Um, Nancy Pelosi remains in the House. But uh, Hakeem Jeffries is the leader. Catherine Clark's the minority whip, uh, replacing Steny Hoyer. And Pete Aguilar is the caucus chair. Um, and uh, uh, um, Jim Clyburn, though, remains engaged um, in, uh, in some uh, emeritus position within Democratic House leadership. But that's really a, um, a new generational shift in the, uh, in the Democratic House, House leadership. In the Senate, uh, you have um, very similar faces. Um, there was a little bit of a uh, topsy-turvy road for Leader McConnell to return to the head of the Republican Party in the Senate. Nonetheless, it was more or less a foregone conclusion as well. Uh, John Thune is the number two, and then uh, John Barrasso is serving as a, as a conference chair. Um, as we look at some of the committee rosters, I just want to take a couple of minutes and identify a few that are of interest to us in the ready mix industry. Uh, obviously, you know, we do a lot of work at the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So having Sam Graves as the chairman, someone that we know with whom we have a great relationship uh, with, uh, whose staff we have a great relationship with, and we know them uh, very, very well, uh, it's, it's, um, it's certainly uh, a, um, a plus. And then there's a number of new committee chairmen or subcommittee chairmen, I should say, 
So uh, Congressman Dan Webster is serving as um, a subcommittee chair, uh, and Scott Perry is also serving as a subcommittee chair. Scott Perry is the co-chair of the Ready Mix Concrete Caucus, uh, and he is now sir, uh, chairing the subcommittee at, at the TNI committee that oversees public buildings, which could become very uh, relevant um, as we continue to deal with uh, things like buy clean um, at GSA and uh, GSA. Uh, continues to um, more or less ignore industry. A number of new members to the committee that are going to be great friends and allies of ours, uh, Tracy Mann from Kansas, Mike Collins from Georgia, um, uh, Congressman Collins, uh, Danny, I had a chance to sit down with him uh, last week. He owns a trucking company. He gets trucking issues. Uh, he wants to help. He wants to, to uh, do what he can uh, on behalf of the industry, his family. Uh, owns a ready mix business. He, he uh, said he grew up um, uh, uh, essentially on a ready mix plant. So he's uh, he's going to be uh, certainly a a good ally for the industry on the TNI committee. A number of others that we supported in, in their primaries are now on the committee. Tom Keen from New Jersey, Derek, Derek Van Orden from Wisconsin, uh, Val Hoyle from Oregon, one of the new Democratic members, and then. Uh, the new uh, top Democrat on the committee is Rick Larson. Um, that's a that's a great win for the industry as we have an excellent relationship with um, Ranking Member Larson. Uh, someone else that we're working on building a relationship with and, and see being able to work with nicely is uh, Mary Peltola. Uh, took to Don Young's seat in Alaska and um, is uh, is is uh, well thought of, and we look forward to working with her as well. On the Agriculture Committee, there's some new faces um, at the very top of the Agriculture Committee, the chairman, Glenn Thompson. Uh, this could be an interesting uh, um, challenge. Uh, although we have a good relationship with his office, he's a big fan of uh, mass timber and the mass timber industry and the wood industry in general. Uh, it's a lot of uh, domestic interests back in his district. At the same time, we have uh, good friends on the, on the committee. Uh, who are uh, both on the TNI committee and on the agriculture committee, like uh, David Rouser from North Carolina, Dusty Johnson from South Dakota, Tracy Mann from Kansas, uh, Mark Molinaro from uh, New York. These are all folks that we're going to um, continue to, that we have relationships with, and we're continuing to, uh, to build those relationships out. On the Ways and Means Committee, the Tax Writing Committee, uh, Jason Smith, um, in what came as a bit of a surprise to many, Jason Smith became the uh, the chairman, um, beating out Vern Buchanan from Florida, who uh, everyone expected to have a, a fairly easy ride into the chairmanship. Um, Jason Smith's a good friend of the industry. Uh, we've known him for a long time. We have great relationships with him, with his staff. And so uh, this is going to be uh, a really, really um, huge plus for uh, for for the ready mix industry, some some friends who have moved on to the committee. Um, Brian Fitzpatrick was on transportation and infrastructure committee. He's a friend of ours from Pennsylvania. Blake Moore, who uh, led the um, the uh, the the charge for us on the mass timber industry or uh, mass timber opposition uh, when he was on the armed services committee, is now on the ways and means committee, uh, a more prestigious committee. Uh, Michelle Fishbach, who we were able to get to know um, last year, uh, Nicole Maliotakis from New York. These are all new members with whom we have uh, great relationships who are now on this tax writing committee. Um, a number of Democrats have also uh, either been elevated on the committee or moved on to the committee. Uh, in particular, Bill Pascrell, who's the uh, sponsor of our Disaster Savings Resilient Construction um, tax credit bill. Uh, Dan Kildee, who co-sponsored the bill last year, and then Jimmy, Jimmy Panetta, with whom we have a growing relationship. On the Appropriations Committee, uh, we had some shuffling around. And so uh, while Mario diaz Bellart from Florida was chairing the Transportation Housing, or, uh, uh, Housing Urban Development Subcommittee that really oversees a lot of the money that goes to transportation, um, the Republicans have a rule you can only be at the top of a committee or subcommittee for six years. And then you have to move on. So uh, he had been at the top of the uh, um, the transportation uh, subcommittee for for six years, and so now we have a new uh, new chair, uh, Tom Cole from Oklahoma. 
He's um, certainly a, a fantastic uh, person to replace uh, Mario diaz Bellart. Mario remains on the subcommittee and uh, obviously a great friend of, uh, of our industry. Um, similarly, Ashley Hinson, Ryan Zinke, uh, Scott Franklin. So Ryan uh, Zinke is a um, newly uh, re-elected. He, he um, served as uh, President Trump's Secretary of the Interior and then ran again for Congress after uh, or this past um, term when Montana got a second congressional district. Uh, Scott Franklin, who we built a relationship with when he was working on or when he was serving on the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, Jerry Carl and Stephanie Bice both are new to the um, uh, to the committee as well, and um, we're uh, we're excited to work with both of them. We we have worked with them in the past uh, on different committees, but working with them on the Appropriations Committee as issues come up uh, within their jurisdiction uh, will be. Um, uh, beneficial to the industry. Speaking of the Armed Services Committee, we have a new chairman at Armed Services who is a uh, not uh, friendly to um, to uh, competitive materials issues, and so uh, we're we're likely to see uh, the fights that we had over mass timber building at DoD um, simmer down. Uh, they're not going to be as well received by the new chairman. Um, uh, similarly, Rob Whitman from Virginia is chairing a subcommittee now. And um, I had a, a wonderful meeting with him uh, just a, a week or so ago. And he uh, he flat out told us that uh, that that the wood stuff is is not going to fly uh, under the new under the new guard. So hopefully we see some um, some settling down of, of that issue. Uh, some of the new members from uh, this last um, election are are serving on the Armed Services Committee. We've gotten to meet a number of them. Jen Kiggins, uh, from Virginia, uh, Nick Lalota from New York, and uh, Mark Alfred from Missouri. Uh, we're looking forward to working with all of these folks and continuing to build these relationships and and reinforce our issues uh, on the Armed Services Committee. Um, touching really briefly on energy and commerce, uh, our good friend Kelly Armstrong from North Dakota is now the vice chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee. This is the committee that oversees much of the climate policy that comes out of the uh, the house, um, and so we're excited to see him there uh, on financial services. You know, we'll, we'll, TBD on whether or not we get a flood insurance reauthorization this year, but financial services is the committee that oversees that. Um, our good friends uh, Dan Muser is new to the committee. Mike Flood, Zach Nunn, uh, Mike Lawler, Stephen Horsford, Wiley Nickel. All of these are are new to the committee. Some are new to Congress. Um, so uh, uh, Mike Lawler, Zach Nunn, and Wiley Nickel are, are all uh, freshman members um, and are serving on the uh, Financial Services Committee. So that's a little bit of, of just an overview of what uh, the 118th Congress looks like so far for the ready mix industry and sort of the relationships that we're working on building. What do we expect to see out of the 118th Congress? Um, you know, I think the bottom line is not not a whole lot. Um, although there will be there will be a lot of activity, uh, it's you know, TBD on what will actually make its way through and get passed into law. Oversight uh, in the House is going to be big, and confirmations in the Senate are going to be big. And this is where you're going to see a lot of the sort of political activity taking place. In the House, you're going to see both um, political uh, oversight and also policy oversight. So you're going to see um, uh, oversight being used as a tool uh, when um, legislation that the House didn't really get a say in, such as the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, the folks on the uh, T and I committee have made it pretty pl plain that they they would like to use their uh, their oversight authority to essentially have their say um, on on the bill itself. And uh, I spoke with a with a Democrat. Um, office yesterday and they they were telling us that you know they they're they're considering putting together a package of things that the house would have wanted to see in an infrastructure bill and um was not able to uh because of the way that it was drafted in the senate behind closed doors among 20 senators and then presented to the senate as sort of a um a uh, a finished package so in addition to that of course you're going to see a lot of Political oversight, Hunter Biden's laptop is going to make an appearance. 
Uh, no doubt the withdrawal from Afghanistan is going to be a hot issue. Um, now the uh, balloons or whatever, these unidentified flying objects that are being shot down, um, these are going to become uh, issues for, for oversight. And uh, you'll see the, the um, weaponization of the federal government uh, special committee doing quite a bit of attention or uh, headline grabbing uh, um, work, uh, or I should say uh, activity. I don't know if you can call it work, um, but you know it's going to boil down to there's a few must pass pieces of legislation every year. And you've probably heard this, me say this um, at the beginning of every year, uh, it's budget and appropriations. So the administration will put forward a budget. We already know it's going to be about a month late. So we will see this sometime in uh, April, maybe May. And um, then uh, the House will put together their 12 appropriations bills, and um, they'll either consider them together separately, uh, most likely in smaller packages. Um, I know there is a, a strong interest in uh, doing these appropriations bills um, one by one. We'll see if that becomes anything close to reality. Um, but at some point, they will have to figure out how to uh, to fund the government. Um, you know, with appropriations being uh, the the setting the setting the um, or, or, or uh, the budget setting sort of the top line numbers, and then appropriations coming out with um, you know how how much they're going to spend where you know, you're going to have fights between Republicans and Democrats, and it's hard to see uh, finding a lot of common ground between um, the House and the Senate. In the White House. Um, a few other things that uh, need to pass is the Defense Authorization Act, uh, NDAA, um, has to pass every year. For the past 50 plus years, it has in fact passed, uh, so we can expect that to pass, and then um, at some point they're going to need to raise the debt ceiling, and that's going to be another brawl. Um, uh, Republicans are going to insist that it's coupled with cuts. Um, you know, I think we all saw during the State of the Union that uh, they uh, uh, effectively uh, took uh, Social Security and Medicare, um, so essentially mandatory spending programs, uh, the, the most expensive ones off the table. So it'll be interesting to see where they come with, uh, with their proposed cuts. Uh, things that are going to need to get done, aside from the absolute must pass in order to, fund, to, to keep the government going, Things that need to get done um, are things like the uh, FAA, the Federal Aviation Reauthorization, the Water Resources Development. So FAA expires this year, so it needs to get reauthorized by um, the end of September this year. Uh, water Resources uh, expires next year, um, so it needs to get done by the end of uh, September in, in 2024. Um, the other big piece that's going to be coming up is the Farm Bill. Uh, Farm Bill is a five-year bill. And it reauthorizes or it authorizes the the programs of the federal government as it relates to agriculture, uh, some commodities programs, and also uh, a number of um, social welfare programs, food stamps or um, WIC or wh whatever they're calling it these days. Um, and that's going to expire at the end of September 2023. And so I was um, speaking with some with some folks on the agriculture committee, and they were saying, look, you know. If this doesn't, if we don't have text uh, before June, we're not going to have a bill that can, uh, and that's probably a, that's probably a, an optimistic timeline. I mean, they probably need text by May in order to to hammer out an agreement. So uh, there's a good chance that that doesn't happen until um, you know you get a one year extension from 23 to 24, and then in 24, well, you have an election year, and no one likes to do anything big, so this could get punted to to 2025 with a with two one year extensions, something like that. You know, the, the reason the farm bill is important to us is because this is where a lot of pro wood and uh, um, and uh, mass timber um, programs get inserted. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to or <laughs> gives us the opportunity to to sort of confront those. And so we have to uh, begin socializing our opposition to those two uh, offices on the Agriculture Committee uh, early. And so if it does end up getting extended, that um, essentially just carries forward the the current policies, which uh, in 2018, we were able to strip out um, a, a Tallwood building program, um, and so TBD on whether or not the uh, the wood folks are going to go back for 
for a second shot at that. But given their uh, aggressive posture, I would expect that that they will. Um, the other thing that will expire uh, at the end of this fiscal year, so at the end of September 2023, is uh, a flood insurance program. Um, the Financial Services Committee has tried several times to put forward a, a uh, you know, full-throated reauthorization of the flood insurance program. Um, it continually gets caught, so caught up in, in um, you know, sort of uh, both uh, geographic and, um, and partisan divides. Um, and so if, uh, you know, if that, if that um, uh, gets, if we get close to September and there's no, no uh, reauthorization, we can expect another extension. We, we're interested in the flood insurance program because in the past we have inserted in the various reauthorizations uh, let it, language that um, directs the use of certain uh, resilient materials, um, which of course uh, caters uh, quite a bit to to concrete. Tax extenders is a perennial uh, piece that uh, eventually gets done, uh, sometimes after the fact, um, but that'll also be in play toward the end of the year. Uh, the you know the the absolute reality is that there's not a whole lot of big legislation that's going to move. Um, you have a Republican House, a Democratic Senate, and Democratic President, and so you're going to see uh, probably more of the slow start we've seen to the 118th Congress uh, continue. You know, you look back at this time during uh, two years ago, and you know Democrats were cranking out messaging bills um, by. I mean, we're we're a month and a half into the um, the Congress, and and we've had very few. Um, you know, high-profile Republican messaging bills, and so I think that we're we're looking at just overall a fairly slow uh, uh, Congress. Um, there's a good deal. Of, a Democrat I was talking to yesterday pointed out to me there's a good deal more recess built into the calendar this year than there was um, during the last Congress as well. Um, so. In order to get anything done, obviously you have to get 218 votes in the House. That's um, a majority of the of the voting members. Uh, you have to clear the 60 vote threshold in the Senate, and then you have to get it signed by the president. So that's sort of the the uh, the legislative math that just is a very very um, strong reality check on a lot of the hopes and dreams of um, partisans in Congress. Um, but what does it? set that set you know set us up for you know we we believe that it does set up for the potential for small ball legislating so if you can find some some non technical or some nonpartisan bipartisan technical bills that kind of fly under the radar that you can address issues like tax credits for disaster resilience etc um you, you may have the the opportunity to uh to sort of fly under the radar from some of the partisan squabbles and 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 get those done um, the other thing that um, we, we now, uh, I think, uh, have the opportunity to do is to spend some time setting the table for future uh, for future wins, right? This is the time that we socialize, we find champions for various policy proposals. We explore, explore new policy proposals that maybe we have not uh, tackled because we've either been uh, playing really aggressive offense or really aggressive defense, um, but this is, gives us an opportunity to uh, find some of those policies that... Uh, um, are critically important to the ready mix industry or that are just huge value adds to the ready mix industry. And we begin identifying champions for those. And then uh, with, a, with an eye, not necessarily to passing them this Congress, but to add them to a, um, a future uh, package that's moving. And this is how NRMCA was able to get its hours of service victory is uh, we didn't do it all in one Congress. We were able to move it along um, uh, through various Congresses. So what are we going to be working on? Um, a number of high profile things that, that, and I'm going to just go through all of this uh, fairly quickly. I don't want to spend too much time going into the weeds on a lot of this, um, because we will uh, talk through a number of these issues, uh, in, in a couple of weeks when we do our advocacy and issues review. Um, but some of the important things that, that, uh, we have to do and that we will do be doing um, in conjunction with with our friends at NSSGA and the Portland Cement Association is really working to protect the uh, the funding that was in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, you know, there's this persistent notion out there that this was all Green New Deal spending. It wasn't real 
real infrastructure. We've run into a couple of uh, new members who have said, oh, that's just a, just a, a, a Green New Deal boondoggle. Uh, when the reality is that of the almost a trillion dollars that was included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, you know, more than half a trillion of that is going to state DOTs uh, to, to reauthorize the five-year highway program. And then a lot of it's also going to really important things like uh, bridges, mega projects, and things like that. And so um, we do have a little bit of an uphill um, uh, uh, climb ahead of us in making sure that new members of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and some of the existing members understand the importance of the IIJ funding, bipartisan infrastructure bill funding to their state. Um, and to, we were able to push back on efforts to to claw some of that back. And I put IRA funding here as well because some of the um, funding for the IRA uh, is multiple billions of dollars um, in uh, in highway funding and uh, or funding for highway projects, and also in uh, construction funding at uh, at GSA and other places. Speaking of GSA, one of the places we need to continue to engage in the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act is on the administration's work on buy clean. And so um, the Inflation Reduction Act really fueled the White House's efforts on buy clean to set some low carbon procurement standards. Um, GSA, is, is, uh, uh, you may remember, last year rolled out a standard for low carbon concrete and asphalt. And it was about this time, in fact, uh, it was exactly uh, one year ago today that they released their RFI and they collected uh, industry response for uh, nine business days, closed the RFI, and then on March 30th, rolled out their, their low carbon standard, uh, unveiled it to the public, effective March 17th. So, um, you know, part of what our engagement is, is, is expressing our frustration over that kind of, uh, of work. They, GSA recently expanded their RFI to additional products. And so our friends in the steel industry were treated to the same uh, experience. Um, and uh, I, I heard from the folks over at the Iron and Steel Institute, and they were they were pretty unhappy. Um, but GSA is, is going to be sort of the tip of the spear here. Um, and, our, uh, and what we're, we're paying a close attention to is how closely DOT follows on uh, what they're doing. Um, it's going to be impacted by the Inflation Reduction Act uh, implementation of uh, low carbon labeling and EPD assistance programs. Um, there's an RFI out on those now. NRMCA, PCA, NSSGA are working together to respond to that and make sure that we have a unified front, uh, but also that we make that we get the information for each of our industries um, to EPA to ensure that they roll this out in the spirit in which it was written, uh, because we were able uh, to uh, to have to have a hand in in how this provision was crafted, um, but then also to ensure that it doesn't um, you know disadvantage any uh, of our uh, members, whether it's geographically or size wise. Uh, workforce uh, continues to be um, one of the most pressing issues that we hear from our members on, and and um, we have been. Um, looking at a number of workforce-related uh, bills. Um, there's a couple that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in, in a minute, um, but that'll be a priority for, for 2023. Uh, defending against market attacks from mass timber, that'll be another uh, priority. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think you know, our hope is that we have uh, put this issue to bed, at least on the national defense side at DOD. Um, and... Uh, we will continue to pay attention to other pieces of legislation, such as the Farm Bill and appropriations for uh, anti-competitive and material preference provisions. Um, labor policy continues to be a year in, year out fight for us. Um, the administration uh, recognizes that they were not able to pass the PRO Act through Congress. And as a result, they're working uh, overtime at the Department of Labor uh, and the National Labor Relations Board to um, push out labor policy. Um, so the expanded Davis-Bacon prevailing wage standards is going to be an issue. Uh, we uh, had a call with um, the uh, the um, uh, OIRA, the Office uh, that uh, of Information 
um, that is sort of the last stop before um, a, a regulation gets published. Um, NSSGA, NAPA, and us uh, were on that call and um, you know just reiterating our opposition to their expanded Davis-Bacon requirements. Um, project labor agreements and local work requirements are something else that the administration was unable to uh, accomplish through legislation and instead are doing it through um, uh, regulatory and administrative action. And uh, so we are um, engaging with uh, with the Coalition for a Democratic Workplace and others, the uh, associate builders and contractors um, to oppose these um, efforts by the administration and also to support legislation that would prohibit the use of PLAs um, as a requirement for winning a bid on a federal project. And then, as I mentioned, you know, the whole idea of setting the table for uh, future um, policy work, you know, a number of uh, items that we've batted around and um, you know, we'll be seeking the committee's input on um, is, are, are things like trying to find grants for carbon sequestration research, um, research on recapturing and processing fly ash for use in concrete. Um, these are both items that our technical folks have flagged for us that um, could, could use some legislative attention. Um, resilience standards for federal buildings, uh, legislation relating to truck weights and um, tax credits for resilient construction, but also for things like safe rooms that are concrete intensive, um, and then federal assistance to install and maintain um, natural gas fueling infrastructure. So these are just some ideas of potential legislation that we could um, uh, look into pursuing here as we um, are, are trying to you know, set the table for the next wave of pro ready mix um, policy that uh, the NRMCA can advocate for. Um, so with that, I'm actually now going to kind of go into uh, sort of a hit list of, of hot topics that are um, uh, occupying a lot of our time and attention at the moment. Um, this one is really hot off the press. Uh, we met with um, uh, OMB last week uh, on Monday. And um, just, I guess, to, to go back for a minute, uh, Buy America requires that anything used in a construction project is um, is uh, bought in America, or at least 55% uh, of the cost of the materials used. Um, it's, a, it's a awfully burdensome uh, regulation, and it's a unworkable regulation for 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 much of the um, much of the ready mix industry um, in some uh, geographic spaces more than others. But uh, in general, having to comply with something like this really uh, messes with um, supply chain and uh, and and <clears throat> allocating product. Um, and so when the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, was going to include a new Buy America uh, coverage, we, uh, under leadership of NSSGA, had a coalition that really worked to secure an exclusion from this Buy America preference. And so the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill specifically excludes cement and aggregates, um, aggregate binders and additives from being considered mat construction materials or inputs to manufactured products. And so essentially it, it really takes our product out of the purview of Buy America. So if you are using uh, co uh, ready mix concrete in a project, there is no reason you as a contractor should ever have to ask for a certification that your uh, that the ready mix uh, complies with Buy America because uh, all, all of the components or all of the inputs to ready mix are excluded from Buy America. Well, <clears throat> this is how the language was written. This is how it was our understanding. This is how all 50 states have interpreted it. Um, last week, we met with uh, the Office of Management and Budget, who oversees the Made in America uh, policy at the federal level, and um, they're, uh, they, they were very um, uh, non-responsive to, to our questions as to you know, how they were interpreting this, um, but then we kind of found out why the next day, because in the State of the Union, the president talked about the importance of using American-made 
construction materials to build all roads and bridges. And so uh, the next day, we got draft guidance from OMB that very clearly um, called into question the um, exclusion of our materials. It, it said, I think I wrote it in here, yes, the act does not specify whether these mater excluded materials should be entirely excluded from coverage under Buy America preferences. It's like the difference between, you know, all dead and mostly dead. Um, you know, it, it, it's very frustrating for us because the um, you know, language is, is very clear in our interpretation and, um, and, and, and from all 50 states interpretations. Um, and so now uh, we are engaged, engaged with, um, with our, our sister associations in um, not just working with OMB, but also going to the folks on the Hill who helped us with this exclusion to write the legislative language and um, uh, w uh, potentially even finding a, a legislative solution to this. Hey, Andrew, uh, John, hey, hey John. Here. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, yeah, sure. I, we've, we've been following a lot. Of, a lot of us have been following this very closely, as you know. Um, the, the OMB guidance also appeared to, uh, or some maybe the Q and A's. I can't remember which piece of this. I've looked at so much stuff. The, the, the OMB guidance appears to be giving them an opportunity, at least, to consider trying to claw back the manufactured uh, products exception as well. Um, you know, our our my legal team, uh, our law group, not not too concerned because of the manufactured products. Uh, exemption that FHWA has always had, but for the OMB guidance, uh, you know, the president's tone a couple of weeks ago, other agencies, y'all correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but other agencies don't have that blanket uh, waiver for manufactured products. This is an FHWA specific waiver. Is, isn't that right? And if it is, then that's where, in my view, we where we really have to be vigilant is them trying to claw back manufactured products because at least in our, my company's opinion, concrete and asphalt, whether it's in the legislation or not, is a manufactured product made in the U.S. So anyway, that those are just my two cents. Is that your understanding or what, or if you're nodding your head, so I'm assuming yeah, yeah. fear maybe of where, where we might be headed over the near term, not just this 30-day comment period? <clears throat> yeah, so... John, this is yeah, that's exactly uh, how we see it as well. And and the thing with the the waiver from I think what 1983 um, for manufactured products is, um, it's my understanding that IIJ directs a review of the waiver and to ensure that the waiver is not less stringent than the new Buy America. Um, guidelines set forward in the act is it i don't know if, if well, there's the trick there's the tricky part then right yeah right exactly so right so so you know th there's two parts to to the exclusion right so first of all it's exclude the, these products are excluded from being considered construction materials and secondly they're excluded from being considered inputs to manufactured products so at the end of the day ready mix concrete is not a construction material for the purposes of being covered under construction pillar ready mix concrete is not a manufactured product for the purposes for the purposes of being uh, uh, manufactured products that are covered by buy america because the inputs are all excluded from consideration so you know the 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 the, the verbiage of the questions on, in the draft guidance ask how they should interpret it now the tone or what I'm reading between the lines and, and you know, and I don't think I'm alone here is we are looking for a way to cover everything now, but at the same time, they also reference very specifically precast. And so there is some thought that maybe they're trying to get at precast products specifically because of some previous dumping issues. And, um, you know, but that's the only actual product that's called out. Yeah, precast precast products can you know that's a that's another that's another issue because precast concrete products can have well, they've got iron and steel and other kinds of things that potentially are covered by my, by America. So that's a whole to me kind of another set of issues. While the ready mix concrete that goes into precast is exempt, there are other components that 
the manufacturer will have to will have to address. It, yeah, so, exactly, and that's the way we see it too, John. And okay, that's what our good. that's what our feedback to OMB will reflect. Um, so they they they've got a thirty day comment period going on now. We are so NRMCA, PCA, NSSGA, and NAPA are working on some. Well, obviously, we're going to do comments. We're also going to do like a um, a form that we can push out to our state affiliates, any member company, and then instructions on how to, you know, just tailor it to your company and then also make make a submission because this is open to everyone. It's, they're, they're, they're taking comments from literally everyone in the world. Yeah. Um, and we'd love for as many of our members as possible to, um, you know, to, to file comments. Well, I, I listen, I, and I don't want to belabor this. I know y'all are working on it um, to, to get within the comment period, but thank you for working with our sister associations. We're all in the same boat here is the way I look at it. The exclusion we're lumped in, you know, we're lumped in one line in the exclusion and, you know, whether you're ready mix or asphalt or, or whatever, if you're in this space, we're all together in my, my view. So thank you for continuing to coordinate together, I think, joint comments. And if each association wants to do additional separate comments, I think that's fine. But I think a joint comment from the groups you just referenced is a is a positive. Yeah, that's that's the plan, John. And so yeah, well, I mean, look, and we're right now we're just also trying. I know AGC is weighing in as well to get this uh, um, the 30 day uh, comment period extended to a 60 day comment period. Um, so all of that, um, you know, is in play. Um, but uh, if it's not extended, then the comment period will will expire when we're all together in um, in Vegas. So more to come on that. Uh, in addition to the hey Andrew, real quick, Andrew, yes. before you move on, Jay Martin. Hey Jay, uh, with Semex, um, agree with everything you and John just laid out. Uh, thanks for your work on this. I guess my one question I had that was you made a mention of um, you know a legislative follow up. I guess what did you mean by that? Because Obviously, my concern is I don't want to go down a road where we're doing any sort of introduction of legislation saying, yeah, we really met what we said the last time we did legislation. Yeah. Because I think at the end of the day, yeah. it potentially could just dilute the argument from our language in IIJ. No, so the, the so first the first approach is um, Baldwin and Braun's office, like seeking a letter because they were the ones that drafted the or sponsored or worked with us to secure. Um, we haven't talked about a legislative vehicle, um, but going to, you know, get a letter. Um, that's, I think that's as far as we're going to go right now. Okay. I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you. For yeah. the okay. Good deal. Yep. You bet. Um, all right. So really quick, let's, uh, something else that's in play. Um, the EPA labeling assistance programs. These are both pieces of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. There's $100 million in the Inflation Reduction Act for a low carbon labeling program, which is intended to create a, a label for construction materials that are substantially lower in uh, embodied carbon. Um, and then an EPD assistance program because the label is based on uh, information from EPDs. So these two uh, pro programs are now uh, on, in the process of being implemented by EPA. Uh, they've put out an RFI that's open until May um, on, on both of these. Uh, again, we're looking at doing joint comments with our sister associations. This is an important issue for, for all uh, three, four of our associations. Um, and um, we're, you know, we're, we're engaged on this. Uh, you know, th this is one thing that we think is really important to um, that, that the EPA get right, um, because it's going to inform not just uh, these two programs, but it's also going to inform the DOT by clean program, which is going to be based on uh, information gathered from EPDs. And so um, we'll be we'll be closely engaged uh, on the on the implementation of this. There's an interesting article this morning. Um, I saw it talking about how the uh, ambitions of the Biden administration are running into the staffing realities of the EPA. And it said that in order for them to effectively do all the things they've been tasked with, they need to hire another 20,000 staff and have a 40% budget increase, which um, I don't think is really going to be popular when uh, it comes up 
as a question on on the hill so interesting piece and i was all, i was wondering why they had the uh, comment period open until may 1st while gsa is doing 15 day comment periods um and i think they, they this you know could be um a uh a, a hint into um you know, why that might be mass timber I'm not going to beat this uh, and, uh, uh too too much anymore um you know, we were successful the last two years in defeating a mass timber building program in the national defense authorization act We've also opposed uh, appropriations for mass timber um, at uh, DOT. Uh, the farm bill is going to be a um, a place where you see a lot of mass timber policy. And then I just want to punt this forward because uh, at our last meeting in um, Denver, we uh, had some discussion in the in the committee meeting as to whether or not this was uh, a productive use of NRMCA government affairs uh, resources. And so uh, I'll just flag this for everyone. This will be something that we talk about during our advocacy and issues review uh, on March 1st. Workforce development. I think I talked through a number of these things. Uh, I'll just flag a couple of these issues for, for everyone. Um, there's a bill called the Ship It Act, and it's very similar to a bill from last year. Um, the, the bill basically allows for... Uh, personal grants to individuals who want to become commercial truck drivers and it basically will give you give them a grant in the amount of entry level entry level driver training and whatever additional costs they may occur in securing their CDL this uh, I think we like uh, the second piece part of this legislation um, provides a tax credit for uh, class A, CDL holders and who drive class A uh, trucks. Now, this part we don't like because uh, we already have enough uh, of a hard time attracting folks to drive class B ready mix trucks. And so if you give them a $7,500 federal incentive, um, you know, I think we, we see a lot of our folks go to drive long haul. Uh, based on NRMCA's um, uh, driver retention survey, of the 20, 25,000 drivers who leave the industry every year, 42% of those leave to go to long haul. So we're already seeing attrition because of long haul. And so we've shared this with the um, uh, sponsors of the legislation. They're very open to changing it. Our ambition is to see uh, this tax credit expanded from uh, uh, um, class A's to class B's, which would make uh, ready mix drivers eligible for the $7,500 tax credit as well. Um, there's another piece of legislation here, the Workforce for an Expanded Economy Act. Uh, Scott, I know you've been a big fan of this piece for a long time. John, I know CRH is a big fan of this piece. It's a piece of legislation put forward by Lloyd Smucker, who um, is uh, on the Ways and Means Committee. And he uh, it, it basically establishes a uh, worker program for the construction industry. The agriculture industry has one, hospitality has one. This would give one to the construction industry. Um, so that wraps up my sort of, uh, you know, sort of hot topics, um, things that we've already seen a lot of activity on, at least from an NRMCA perspective uh, for the year. Um, just really quick flag for everyone, a couple of upcoming um, meetings and calls. The first is I've referenced already our advocacy and issues review. Uh, we'll, I'll send out another uh, reminder on this uh, with login information. We also um, are going to try and do a survey before that just to get a, get a sense of um, you know, priorities and, uh, and uh, policy issues that are uh, um, particularly important. And we'll, we'll survey the, the full government affairs committee. We'll do a committee meeting in Vegas as part of our annual convention. Uh, it'll be on um, Saturday the 11th, and then we'll do a joint meeting with NSSGA and PCA, government affairs teams. And I'm happy to say, we're gonna have uh, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee Chairman, Sam Graves out there as well, and the ranking member, the top Democrat, uh, um, Rick Larson, will be in attendance um, in addition to, to Sam Graves. So we'll have both the, uh, the top Republican, top Democrat from the TNI committee, um, as part of this uh, this just joint government affairs meeting. Uh, finally, everyone should put on their calendars the Transportation Construction Coalition fly-in. Um, this is an, a, a construction industry 
uh, Hill Day. Um, it'll be May 16 and 17. Um, and uh, let me know if you're coming. I'll, I'll, I'll receive the, uh, the list of, of um, attendees regardless, but uh, we'll um, be happy to help set up meetings um, and uh, make sure that you're meeting with your members of Congress and folks that have a uh, presence in or uh, represent the area that uh, you have a presence in. Finally, for those attending Concrete Pack and who have already given prior approval to uh, NRMCA, uh, there will be a PAC event. If you want more information about that, there will be a PAC event at NRMCA's annual convention. If you want more information about that, email Danny Fitzpatrick um, and he can get you more information. If you have not given NRMCA prior approval, you can use this QR code to get um, give uh, give prior approval to, to NRMCA and, and then we can uh, legally tell you about all kinds of really, really, really awesome stuff about the PAC and um, what the PAC's doing. So with that, um, I'll open it for any questions, comments, discussion. I, have, I know we went through a lot of stuff really fast, um, but wanted to make sure we at least uh, touch base with, uh, with you all um, before we got too far into the 118th Congress. All right, I'm going to hang around until three o'clock uh, my time. If anyone wants to uh, stay and chat about anything, we can uh, do that. Hang on, I got it. Um, and then uh, otherwise, happy to, uh, or I look forward to seeing everyone in, in Las Vegas. Andrew, uh, since you're kind of just hanging on for hey, the Ken. end here, can you uh, give us a, uh, an editorial commentary on uh, Santos's prospects? <laughs> just for fun oh man uh listen i think he's gonna just stick it out um he's not gonna get reelected. he'll lose the republican primary we'll probably lose that seat the republicans will probably lose that seat but um it's a, it's a bizarre 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 yeah it's bizarre <laughs> it is hey danny danny you're from new york you 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 know more about this stuff what are your thoughts it's a typical new york situation uh <laughs> We do. We we have what we have one of these every year. This isn't even that unusual. <laughs> now the uh, the rumor that I you know I I've been trying to encourage is that um, he's he's only a f you know a few minutes down the road from Lee Zeldin and that Lee Zeldin may move into district um, to run. Uh, so they're they're trying to set it up. The uh, Nassau County Chairman is pushing quite heavily to get Lee to move over. Um, and then make that his new home base. See well, that would happens. be that would be pretty great. I mean, look, Lee Zeldin's the guy that almost, uh, and by almost, I mean, came closer than anyone ever will in an impossible situation to uh, to um, you know winning the governor's mansion in uh, New York as a Republican. Also, it would be great to have him back. He's a good friend of the industry. So nice to have him back in D.C. Scott, are we going to get Kelly and uh, <clears throat> and um, Hoven out to uh, to your plant again? <clears throat> Possibly. I've also had a conversation with Senator Kramer about... Uh, what a visit out here. Yeah, actually, Kramer is more relevant since he's up for re-election. Not that he's going to have a difficult race, but. So, yeah, we're definitely looking at that. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to seeing everyone in Vegas. Um, our government affairs meeting will be on on the Saturday, and then our joint meeting will be on Sunday, and our PAC event will be Sunday night. So it's going to be a whirlwind, as it always is, at our annual convention in Vegas. All right, I have three o'clock. Thanks, everyone, so much for uh, for taking the time this afternoon. Uh, Scott, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. Good to see you, everybody. Take care. See you in Vegas. Thanks, Thank you. See you Thanks, in Vegas. everyone.